Hello, this is Adele Neme from DataCamp, and welcome to Data Framed, a podcast covering all things data and its impact on organizations across the world. One thing we're looking forward to covering in more detail on the podcast is not only the latest insights on how data science is impacting organizations today, but how the field has evolved and is evolving towards democratizing data science for all. This is why I'm excited to have Sergey Fogelson on for today's episode. Sergey began his career as an academic at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, where he researched the neural bases of visual category learning and obtained his PhD in cognitive neuroscience. After leaving academia, Sergey got into the rapidly growing startup scene in the New York City metro area, where he has worked as a data scientist in digital advertising, cybersecurity, finance, and media. Currently, he's the Vice President of Data Science and Modeling at Viacom CBS, where he leads a team of data scientists and analysts that work on a variety of awesome use cases. In this episode, Sergey and I discuss his background, how data science has evolved since he got into the field, the major challenges he thinks data teams and professionals face today, his best practices gaining buy-in from business executives on data projects, and his best practices when democratizing data science in the organization, and more. If you want to check out previous episodes of the podcast and show notes, make sure to go to www.datacamp.com slash community slash podcast. Sergey, I'm really excited to have you on the show. I've been excited to have this chat on the state of data science, your experiences leading data teams and democratizing data science. Uh, but beforehand, can you please give our listeners a background on how you got into data science? Sure, would love to. Thank you for having me, uh, Dell. I'm really excited uh, also to speak with you about all of this stuff. So uh, my academic background is in AI and cognitive uh, neuroscience. So I got my uh, graduate degree in cognitive neuroscience, applying ML algorithms to functional neuroimaging data. So basically what this means is put people into large scanners, record their brain activity, and then try to decode what's actually happening in their brains using uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, And what I knew was probably about halfway through my PhD, uh, I knew I didn't really want to stay in academia, uh, and I knew I wanted to work on interesting data-related or data-intensive problems. And uh, when I was at that point in my uh, PhD, so this was around 2010 through 2011, I heard about this thing that, that people were talking about called big data, uh, they didn't really have a term for data science at this at this moment in time. And so I just knew that there was this field where you could you could sort of use, I mean, it was still in its infancy, but you could sort of use the same kinds of algorithms that I was using for neuroimaging work, but applied to uh, real world data sets. So data sets in, in uh, advertising, in finance, uh, in quantitative analysis, uh, kind of all over the place. And so basically, I started looking into this stuff, started reading about it. And uh, in my last year, I really made a hard push to try to get into the industry. And I wound up being able to kind of land a job in the uh, world outside of academia and haven't really looked back since. So uh, what were some of the earlier data science projects that you worked on and how has that shaped your path leading data science to Viacom? Yeah, uh, I've had, I I would like to think that I've had pretty varied experiences, but maybe not. Uh, I think they're reasonably eclectic. Uh, So I started my my kind of the very beginning of my career. I worked uh, for a digital advertising startup. And there, the the big two problems I worked on, one was a, a classification problem. And I think it's still a pretty relevant problem. I don't think this problem has really been solved yet. Uh, And it's the idea of uh, taking IP addresses and trying to understand what kind of a place that IP address represents. So, for example, um, is this an IP address associated with a home? Is this IP address associated with an airport or a Starbucks or a, um, you know, some other business? Is it an educational uh, IP address, et cetera? So there is some metadata associated with that information, uh, but it's not 100 percent accurate. Um, So what you can do is you can take the signals that are coming out of that IP address uh, to make probabilistic inferences about whether you think it's a home or not. And that was really important for the work that we were doing because the way that we were building uh, uh, the the main product that this company was selling is called a device graph. Basically, it tells you whether any two devices belong to the same household or not. 
being able to do that and being able to build those 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 links across devices is really critical to understand whether something is a home or not, whether that that device is living or is being seen within a home-based environment or not. So that was kind of um, one of the first projects I had. I also worked a little bit on this on this graph building problem that I just briefly mentioned earlier. So the idea here is again, you're trying to figure out whether two distinct devices, two two phones, an iPhone and a and a, and a, and a tablet or an, an Android phone and a smart TV, for example, whether they uh, belong to the same person or to the same household or not. And again, this relies on uh, some uh, some network analysis problems as well, or uh, techniques rather, and then on um, really thinking about how to be able to do this at very, very large scales. So Back then, this was, again, this was like 2014, uh, there really weren't a lot of uh, large-scale data analysis frameworks. Like Spark was basically at like 0.1 or something. I mean, it was a completely new project. So it was just very difficult to, to and interesting to tackle these kinds of problems that, that involved working with data at scale. So that was kind of my first my first foray into data science. And then after that, um, I moved into uh, cybersecurity. So I worked at a cybersecurity startup for a little while. And there, the, the most important problem that I tackled was really what we called hack prediction. So the idea was, hey, given a company's cybersecurity footprint, so uh, you know, the number of IP addresses that they have exposed to the public internet. Uh, if you can snoop, for example, and see uh, what kinds of uh, software they're running on computers uh, in on those IP addresses, so on servers or on personal computers, etc., uh, you can actually see if the software is all up to date. Uh, we know that, you know, if that software is not up to date, it can be hacked in various different ways. But the idea is, is you take all of these kinds of signals and then you assign a probability score to what the likelihood is that this company is going to get hacked within six months or within a year or within two or three years. Uh, so we called that uh, hack prediction. And then I moved and uh, worked for a small uh, data consultancy where we actually uh, worked for a large investment bank and we worked on what's called an automated account reconciliation problem. So this is not particularly attractive from like a data analysis uh, perspective, but it's actually super critical from a back office perspective. The idea here is you have two distinct accounting systems uh, they occasionally do not line up with each other. They need to be what's called reconciled. And you need to basically assign a likelihood that they actually need to be manually reconciled or they can be uh, basically dealt with by other downstream automated systems. So this is almost like a health check uh, that happens at one point in this massive reconciliation process that happens every day within, within I would say, every major investment bank in in in, in the world where you're, you're trying to basically make sure that your books line up at the end of the day. And this was something that had been done by thousands of people, thousands at this, when, when we first started this project, there was over a thousand people that were actually hired explicitly to do this. So to manually check all of these records. And so what we did was we basically took years and years worth of their manual checks and just put a machine learning uh, algorithm on top of that, right? It was, we, we built this ensemble model and you could say like, look, given this metadata associated with these trades, what's the likelihood that they need to be reconciled manually or, or basically surfaced up to a manual reconciler versus uh, just pass it through the system? Anyway, long story short, using machine learning on past human performance actually worked surprisingly well. We wound up being able to uh, automate basically 90% of the reconciliation process in this way. So only the most difficult to reconcile records wound up being actually validated by human beings, which meant that those people that were hired to do this can now do other more meaningful, more impactful stuff. So I think that was, that was an overall win.
Yeah, I think all of these projects that you've engaged in are super useful in the sense that it gives you this breadth of experience in this data space. And this is one thing that I really want to pick your brains on, is really reflecting on how data science has evolved over the past decade or so. For example, you mentioned that some of the problems you were working on, Spark was still on 0.1, 0.2. There weren't really these mature data analysis frameworks. I'd love to pick your thoughts on what are some of the major changes that you've seen occur over the past decade, and how do you really see it playing out within data science teams today yeah that's a that, i think that's a, a a really interesting thing to to talk about so when i first started again so i started in 2013 uh everything was on hadoop so basically my first work i was working in pig jobs then i was working in hive and then i was also working using a framework that came out of uh, twitter called scalding so it was basically uh hadoop uh, but using Scala, so writing Scala jobs. So Hadoop basically only now exists from the way that I see it uh, in the industry as a legacy system. People are not going out and saying, if I'm going to build a new state-of-the-art data architecture, I'm going to use Hadoop. I don't know anybody that or any company that actually makes that a flashy thing that they describe. Uh, now, what, what do we have? We have uh, Spark is basically completely built out and is co- almost completely taken over uh, data science from like a data processing ETL and even um, ML kind of perspective. So there's there's not really any need to think about about data from like a MapReduce perspective. Uh, and in fact, like I haven't touched a MapReduce job in probably... Well, I want to say three and a half to four years or something. Uh, and now, so before you had most of your data in flat files, right? So again, when I was working, when I was working at uh, uh, the digital advertising startup, uh, we basically had you know petabytes of data in flat files uh, that were either compressed CSVs or back then what was this revolutionary new data format called Parquet, which now, again, is super standard across the industry. But nowadays, it's actually so cheap. I mean, it's still reasonably expensive if you have really, really massive data sets, but it's so cheap to put terabytes of data into structured data warehouses uh, that, that you can actually query data sets that are on the scale of tens or maybe even hundreds of terabytes. I don't I don't I haven't heard of anybody having petabyte scale data warehouses, uh, at least within my industry, because we, we don't really have petabyte scale data yet. But I assume that there's probably somebody in finance or in especially in web scale companies that are probably dealing with petabyte scale data warehouses where you can run basically structured SQL queries that'll give you results within at most, you know, five minutes or something, which is just completely unheard of uh, eight years ago when I when I started. So that's, I think, the first really big difference, I think, that, that people have basically moved. There's still people working with flat files, especially with unstructured data, right? Like you can't just put unstructured data into a relational database, so into a SQL database. So if you have text or you have images, I think it's very hard to still work with those in a more structured environment. I mean, you can definitely put the metadata associated with them into a database, but I don't think you can actually put the raw the, the raw data itself into a database. So there is a place still for unstructured data. But for the most part, if your data is tabular and structured, it's going to be in a massive data warehouse. It's not really going to be in a flat fi- in flat files anymore unless it's completely unprocessed, completely raw, and you're just use it, putting it there for like legacy purposes or for, for safekeeping purposes. The next big thing that's, that I think has happened, and this is really the actual revolutionary thing, I think the most revolutionary thing is really... Um, But again, it's not the sexy stuff. It's the orchestration, data pipelining frameworks for actually being able to automate data jobs on some periodic basis. So we're talking about, you know, uh, frameworks like Luigi, frameworks like Airflow. I mean, there there are obviously other ones. Um, uh, Airflow is what I use now uh, uh, fairly regularly or uh, folks on my team. Uh, work or use fairly regularly. But that whole idea of basically cron for data science, again, that didn't really I mean there were people that were basically using cron uh, in legacy, you know, uh, uh, Linux or, or, or Unix based frameworks for data pipelining for ETL processes. Uh, but they, they really hadn't come into their own at that moment in time. They were still in their infancy. Now, basically, Everyone has some kind of a data uh, uh, pipelining framework that they use um, on a 
across some kinds of jobs within their within their um, data teams, right? That I think is really, really important. That's really the stuff that, that allows you to, to increase the velocity of your data workflows, right? Instead of having to figure out how to automate that stuff, you can basically just build it once, forget about it. It's scheduled, it's run, there's alerting, there's error reporting, all of that stuff is kind of baked in. You have a, you know, you have a front end, all of that stuff. It's just, it's really, really incredibly valuable. Okay, so that's that's kind of the gutworks or skunkworks revolution that has happened in data science. Then on the more ML standard side of things, there's the fact that we now have uh, way more machine learning frameworks, uh, and the vast majority of common machine learning algorithms do not have to be written from scratch. So again, I'll I'll come back to my first gig uh, working in digital advertising. Uh, one thing we had to do was basically do uh, connected components analysis. So after you've built your graph, you need to understand what the size is of all of your basically mini connected clusters, your households. And the problem is, is when you're dealing with a graph that contains uh, hundreds of millions or billions of edges, that was a non-trivial thing to actually be able to compute. So I remember we actually had to write our own connected components algorithm on top of Scala. So it was like you wrote a scalding job that, that created this connected components graph. And that took, you know, that was basically probably three months of work or something or doing that stuff. Now you take a network analysis package, uh, an off-the-shelf package, and it's just baked in and it can handle graphs with hundreds of millions of edges and hundreds of millions of nodes without a problem. Uh, other things. So again, when, when I was starting out, I mean, there was really only like one implementation of gradient boosting that I remember seeing. And then all of a sudden, basically everyone has a gradient boosting implementation. And most uh, gradient boosted implementation frameworks now have GPU options and they're really, really fast and they're really, really robust. I mean, the point I'm trying to make here is that before you had, you had machine learning algorithms that you basically had to implement from scratch or they were really, really difficult to get them up and running at scale. Now, it's not only that you don't have to implement them from scratch, right? I mean, you have you have implementations in various languages that are very, very fast. There are robust communities across each of these ML frameworks. And in many cases, there are GPU versions of things. So now they're way, way faster than they, than they used to be. So again, I mean, you just have open source frameworks. There's lots of them. They're much, much faster than they used to be, and they're much more extensible than they used to be. So I think there's been a, a, a crazy revolution there. But again, I don't know that that is nearly as important as I think the, the skunk work stuff that I talked about earlier. The next things I think are visualization and explainability. So uh, when I started, again, there were very, very limited explainability methods for nonlinear algorithms. So for linear algorithms, common thing you can do right is you just look at you just look at regression coefficients and that gives you basically the full story when it comes to nonlinear methods it's much much harder to say what the actual impact of a given feature is on a specific prediction but that's changing right so now we have some very powerful explainability methods so i can think of shap or Shapley value explanations. We have Lime, which works for, it's more of like a local-based method for uh, explanations for visual problems, so problems in, in image recognition. And these algorithms really have foundationally allowed uh, practitioners to quickly see where signal is uh, in, your, in your feature space and where it isn't, right? Ultimately, this, this, this really kind of it has significantly accelerated how quickly you can iterate on creating new features, feature engineering, right? In ways that we really couldn't do in the kind of the nonlinear algorithm space. So again, line, shap, neither of these things existed when I, when I started. As an aside for that, but I think something that is, that is much bigger now, at least within the past, like I would say, year to two years, is this notion of feature stores. So the idea here is that is that you can actually create basically databases or tables that contain the latest versions of the features that you're using for your machine learning algorithms. And you can quickly update them. You can quickly source them instead of having to recreate them in some process. Uh, you can almost think of them as like, yeah, as like tables that you regularly update with the latest versions of 
whatever your your features you're using to feed downstream models. And what's cool about feature stores is that you can you know you can use them across multiple different uh, different model spaces, right? If you have a new if you have a new data scientist that comes in and you're like, hey, you're going to be working on this churn model, you can immediately point them to a place where all of the latest, greatest features exist for that churn model or from other models that have been built in the past. And so this person can be very quickly brought up to speed with what seems to be working in the problem space that you're that you're attempting to tackle, right? Um, that again, feature stores were not something that existed when I when I started. Yeah, thank you so much for this really interesting rundown of all of that perspective that you've seen evolved in data science over the years. Uh, and I think really like a broad theme that you're talking about here is really the move from experimentation to operationalization and productionization, right? And definitely agree with you as well on the skunk revolution, basically, that you talked about, about how uh, orchestration platforms and really the move to centralized data warehousing, at least for tabular data, has really changed the game for data scientists and their ability to provide value quickly and to scale their work. And I think this is a testament to how much the tooling stack for data scientists over the past years has evolved. And I'd love your insights then on the flip side on where you think there is still room for improvement and where do you think that the data tooling stack is headed? Yeah, so I, I think we're really the the largest place for improvement isn't really on the side of, you know, greater, better, faster machine learning algorithms. I think at this point, I mean, yes, you can always have a better, you know, neural network model that captures 0.1% more performance for this specific task. I think that's always going to be the case. And I think there's always a place for that. But I think it's the operationalization bit that still has the most legs to really grow and mature across all aspects of, of data science. I mean, I, I talked about, you know, I talked about feature stores and these orchestration frameworks and pipelining frameworks, but they're still, I mean, they're, they, they work, but in, in many respects, they're still fairly brittle, right? The automated model performance monitoring isn't still really where I think it would be really great that it could get to, right? So uh, another thing, I think a place where there could still be some significant improvement, or maybe I just, I haven't found, I haven't seen the right product, but seamlessly updating uh, different aspects of the ML pipeline, right? So if you think of like all aspects of the uh, ML pipeline as, as being as modular as possible. So for example, everything from data loading, pre-processing, feature generation, or just the, the kind of the standard, when you think of the JPEG of the data science, uh, a typical data science pipeline, all of those parts, you treat them as if they're like individual, completely isolated boxes that can just be popped in and popped out. But they really can't. I mean, the current issues are that, you know, if you want to change uh, or add a new data source to some to some to some process, or tweak a data source for some process. It's really not seamless. It's not as simple as like, hey, point to this endpoint, and then your model will just magically understand how this data is structured, what needs to be done to convert it, etc. I mean, you basically have to. It's it's you basically have to touch every single box in that. Uh, JPEG that you have for your typical data pipeline and change it in some specific way. So it's really not completely modular in the way that, you know, we think of pure modularity. And that there's there are good things to that, there are bad things to that, but I think there's still some some uh some some improvements that can be done uh in that perspective. And then in general, more around this this modularity stuff, but really more on the real-time side of things. So right now uh, you can do, you can get a lot of stuff done for batch m machine learning models. So what what I mean by that is you basically have a machine learning model that you build at some point time point in time A, then it runs for some specified amount of time, and while it's running, you're getting new data coming into the system, and after that time has passed, you basically recreate a new model that you then reinsert at some pre-specified time, hopefully at a time when it's not system critical that the model is performing at 100% capacity. So you basically take it out and you put a new one in. So this is what I think of as like batch model building in data science. Um, the real-time stuff is much trickier, right? So there is some, you know, there there is work, there are algorithms uh, that, that do uh, real-time uh, updating, right? So you can do real-time gradient descent updates. You can do some real-time updates on coefficients for, you know, in, in linear models, whatever. Um, 
But what I'm talking about is actually what if, for example, you could in real time add in a new feature or take out a feature that isn't performing. Currently, the way you have to do that is you have to do it as if it's a batch process, right? You basically have to turn off that old machine learning model, have, create a new machine learning model where you remove the specific feature or add a new feature, or do whatever it is that you're doing, and then put that in. So obviously, you can try to make that as seamless as possible and, seem, and make it seem as though it was the same model, but really it's not, right? And so... Ultimately, I think this idea of being able to, in real time, modify uh, uh, modify machine machine learning algorithms uh, in in certain use cases that might be very very business critical for certain for, for certain businesses. Thankfully, that's uh, that's not nearly as business critical in 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 some of the in many of the arenas that that, that uh, my team uh, tackles data science uh, projects. But but I can see that being being an issue. Um, so I think basically to a uh, long story short, I think it's, it's this combination of like, Hey, the, the pipelining and, and orchestration stuff still has lots of legs. Um, the, and then real time, uh, model updating or real time changes, uh, both across the pipeline and, uh, uh, at the very end, where we're actually talking about the model itself, I think there's, there's really lots of improvement that can be done there. And with this evolution in mind, by covering the uh, relatively technical limitations that are still present within data teams today, what do you think are some of the other biggest challenges affecting data science teams? Yeah, so I, I think there are uh, two kind of overarching, non-technical, but still very important challenges that need to be tackled. So uh, I think the first one is just uh, a lack of consistent kind of industry-wide processes for things and best practices. So what would be really great is if, you know, there was a data science related, I don't want, I want to say like a field guide or something where we know these are the things that work across the board or work 90% of the time in these kinds of problems. I think right now what's happening, what or has happened, that, that information almost certainly exists in some very distributed, disparate kind of in the ether on the internet across like random blog posts and uh, across, you know, across random, maybe as like tidbits in the documentation in certain frameworks and stuff, right? So you find those golden nuggets and you can be like, hey, these people are saying that this works here. And these people also said that this same thing works here. Maybe this is just a generally good thing to do, right? So one obvious thing that you could say about that is like, hey, standardizing your data is generally a good thing to do. And you know that because, You've heard people say that and you've seen that it's worked well, but there's almost certainly a whole host of other kind of processes or best practices or what have you that don't just involve data pre-processing. Uh, there might be or you know things around this orchestration and pipelining. There might be things about like, what's the best practice for serving up predictions? How should they be done? Should it be done? I mean, I don't know. There's, there, there's just so many things that, in that way that you really can only get by right now via exposure to those problems and exposure to those industry leaders that have actually done those specific things. But really, that's not the way that you grow the overall industry. What you need to do is you need to disseminate that information. And it need, really needs to be captured in some way, almost like in a, you know, in like a Wikipedia for data science where you know exactly kind of the way that those things are done. I mean, granted, I sort of understand why that hasn't happened, right? Like ultimately, there's this belief that like, hey, if that information is scarce, it makes what data science scientists bring to the table as inherently more valuable. I mean, I think to a certain extent in a very like narrow you know, uh, I want to keep being relevant in my job for the next however many years way. Yes, that probably makes sense. Um, but I think in the larger scope, like scale of like, hey, I want to make all of data science be more productive. I don't think it makes sense. Uh, and I think that if you want to democratize data science or get more people to be interested in this stuff or be impactful and to grow, you really need to disseminate this information. And I know that, that it's going to happen eventually, but I think ultimately that this kind of consistent industry-wide 
creation of something like a best practices wiki or something like that, I think would be really, really important. And then, so that's the first thing. That's kind of like a data science across the board kind of critique, I would say, about, about where the challenges are. I think from a, 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 the different perspective, the, the other really, really big challenge is really buy-in by senior executives uh, within uh, legacy companies. I think that, look, if you are a company that was built during the original, you know, heyday of the web. So I would say basically if you were built from like, I don't know, 95 until 2010, uh, you're gonna have data scientists. You're going to have a commitment to data and insights and whatever, because you, you had to have that to survive, especially when the going was really rough post the dot-com bubble uh, of the early 2000s, right? You, you had to be a principled and committed to data and insights from data in order to survive. So from, from those kinds of companies, I don't think there's any, any issue with technical buy-in. So if you're going to, you know, if you wind up, you know, working for a Google or a Facebook or an Airbnb or, or an Amazon or whatever, like that's all solved. I don't want to say it's all solved there, but like they know the data is important. And they understand what the scope of the technical challenges around data management and processing, all that stuff. They understand that it exists. They understand it's super important. You, I don't think that that's really fully happened uh, in the same way at legacy companies. So companies that were that were founded before 1995 or that weren't founded with the internet in mind as their, their primary engine for creating value, for those companies, they really still, it, it, among senior leadership, they, I do not think that they fully understand all of the aspects of what it means to be a fully data-driven, data science-driven company. I think there are still lots of places where you have people making decisions based on their gut, based on intuition, based on industry knowledge. I think all of those things are super important. I think you should never, I'm not saying do not trust your gut I'm not saying do not use your intuition. I'm not saying do not use, you know, your judgment that you've created and honed over however many years of being a senior leader at these companies. What I am saying is, is you need to understand that in order to continue to thrive and survive, you need to start using data much more significantly in order to derive maximum value for your business. And I do not think that they are doing that as much as they should be at these legacy companies. I'm not just talking about, you know, about about where I work now or where I've worked in the past. It's just a general thing where when you start asking asking other data scientists or practitioners or data leaders at, at other organizations and you ask them, hey, like what's your biggest challenge? Nine times out of ten, they're gonna tell you, look, I understand where where the investments should lie. I understand what I what I need to be doing to to make these these things happen. But ultimately I need buy-in. I need people that are uh, uh, in in the most senior leadership, you know, the the C-suite executives, to not only say, you know, uh, every quarter we care about data science uh, during their you know their board meetings, but to actively actually say like, hey, we are going to make investments in data warehousing. We are going to make investments in this monitoring. Hey, we're going to make investments in third-party data that we're going to that we're going to purchase because we understand that the more data that we have that's relevant to our business processes, the more profitable or the more successful that we will be as a business. So I think that's really ultimately, it's the, the fact that we have basically two cohorts, or at least at a minimum, two different kinds of companies that are operating uh, within industry today. You have legacy companies that are saying that they're committed to data science, but still have really not made the, the full plunge. And then, you know, the, the companies that have made the, the, that account for the vast majority in terms of what we would think of like growth and success and value creation, whether it's from like a stock market perspective or whatever. And we're talking about basically Amazon and the post Amazon companies that have been created since then that are full in data full in on technical buy-in and have as a result, you know, created, unlocked, whatever, trillions in value for themselves and for the economy as a whole. 
I think there's so much to unpack in both of these points. But I think the second point that you mentioned of the lack of committed buy-in by senior executives, especially in relatively legacy industries where the organizations have not really used the internet as their primary source of value creation, especially when you think about the Amazons and the Airbnbs and the Ubers of the world. Um, I think that problem, the data culture problem to a certain extent, uh, is one of the biggest problems uh, affecting data science today. So I'd love to expand on that one. Um, As a data science executive, I'm sure that you had tons of experience with gaining buy-in from stakeholders, uh, non-technical ones. Can you walk us through some of the pitfalls data science teams or data science team leaders often encounter when trying to gain buy-in? Yeah, so so I think there are a, a couple that I've noticed anyway. So the, the first, I think, is one that I think in general uh, people people do where they're trying to seem helpful, but it actually ultimately uh, can significantly hinder their long-term um, success within the company. And this is the idea of like, it's the, the, the kind of the wizard claim where people ask you, hey, what can you do for us? And uh, you say, well, everything. I can literally do everything. I can, I can answer every question. I can uh, achieve operational success anywhere you put me. And so, uh, yes, that's probably the case over a long enough timeline. So if I had infinite, <laughs> infinite time and infinite resources, I can solve any question, right? But that's not what a, you know, a senior executive is looking for. What they're looking for is they're going, look, I have these specific things I care about, and I want concrete improvements on these. When you say, when basically, when you overpromise and underdeliver, so my first axiom of being a data science manager is you always under promise and over deliver. You never do the opposite. Okay. So you say you can do a little, but you wind up doing double that amount so that people immediately come away impressed. If you do the opposite and that fosters that buy-in, right? Because as soon as you way over deliver for a given uh, project, people ask, Hey, can you improve this one little thing? And you go, sure. Oh, and by the way, I also did this, 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 and this. That's great. What you don't want to do is go, oh, yeah, I can do that thing, but also I can do this other thing. Oh, and I can do this other thing. Oh, and I can do this other thing on top of that. And then, you know, when you have your next check-in with that senior executive, you've basically gotten 10% of the way across all of those things. and You have nothing actually concrete to show them. So basically over-promising and under, under-delivering, uh, which I think is a general problem for any, um, what I would call like an innovation type group in an organization. I think that's that that will doom your ability to get that longer term buy-in because that now they just, they can't trust your word, right? Like you say one thing that you can do X, Y, Z, A, B, C, and then you wind up only being able to do a third of X a half of Y and a 10th of Z and oh, and by the way, none of them are actually a full letter. Right. And so now you, what, what the hell can I do with that? Right. So in general, doing that is really the best way. Uh, so over promising under delivering is the best way for you to sink your ability to get technical buy-in. So definitely don't do that. The second thing is, is part of this, but it's really in the actual execution aspect. And this is, this is what people talk about, the perfect being the enemy of the good. So, or I, I like to think of like the perfect being the enemy of the good enough or reasonable. Let's just use that. <laughs> you know, like, like where, where you basically just say, look, this works well enough to where it's better than chance. If you have any kind of improvement over what came before, it's good enough. Let's immediately start start putting the gut works around this so this can be a repeated process. It can be productionized, et cetera. In general, you, you hear this a lot, right? Like what are the things that, that – there are like two things you hear about data scientists. Data scientists always say – 80% of my job is data cleaning. And then the other thing that they say is when it comes to actually building a model, the first 20% of the time, you get 80% of the way of the performance. And then the remaining 80% of the time, when you're building the model, you get the remaining 20% of the performance. So what does that actually mean, right? If you think about that in terms of actual time, it means that if you want to get a reasonably good model and you have and you, you spend the first month doing that, if you want to get 
an even, you know, a 5, 10, 15% boost, it's going to take you months and months and months of additional work, right? So what the hell does that mean? What that means is, is those months and months of additional work where you got a, a, a marginal improvements in the overall quality of the model have effectively taken, they, they, they've taken precedence over actually productionizing the model. What should have happened is as soon as you got to something that was better than nothing or better than what came before, no matter how limited that improvement was, you you should immediately start building out the pipelines the you know the the reporting the monitoring the ET, the automating the etl processes automating all of that other stuff to actually get it to a place where it's actually a data product right and so i think that's the second really that's the second really salient point for where where if you're always just talking when you're meeting with senior executives and you're going hey we improved our model we improved our model by by 5%. And then you have another weekly meeting, or well, let's say you're not going to get a weekly meeting with a senior executive. Let's say it's a, a monthly check-in. And so month one, you go, hey, we got to 80%. And then month two, you go, hey, we got to 85%. And then month three, you go, hey, we got to 87%. And then month four, you go, we got to 89%. The executive at this point is going to be like, what are these people doing? You know, like, why isn't this actually being like 80 percent three months ago is way better in terms of in terms of, you know, potential revenue increases or or uh, a decrease in losses is way better than 89 percent now without any any actual data product built and no actual um, no, no actual business critical things driving it, right? So that I think is really, 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 really critical. If you want to get, if you want to get technical, solid technical buy-in from a senior leader, you really, really have to, as soon as you meet criterion, where again, criterion here has to be super low, where you literally just say it's better than what we had before, whatever what we had before was. Um, immediately build something on top of it, build the non ML parts or non core ML parts of that product such that you can immediately show that this thing works. We can deploy it today. It's not going to be great, but it's going to be better than what we had. And Hey, that means that you're saving money. And that's where, as soon as the, the senior leader is like, this is great that we didn't have anything before. Now this thing works. That's where they're immediately going to be like, okay, this is really awesome. How can we get more? And then at that point, you can be like, okay, well, you see, we did this. We can do so much more, but you have to understand here are all of the obstacles that we're facing. And so you basically use a quick win to then drive the more lasting, the more difficult, the more longer term change in that organization. Yeah, getting getting a quick win is so essential to getting one a data culture enthusiastic, like to, to bringing up an enthusiastic data culture within an organization, but to also to get organizational buy-in because you need to be able to provide value fast. Otherwise, there's going to be questions around the value of data science in general. Uh, so on the flip side, what are some of the best practices you found that can help ease an alignment there and ensure organizational buy-in around data projects? Yeah, so it's basically like take everything I said and do kind of the the opposite of that with a little bit with a little bit of with a little bit of other stuff thrown in. So first, uh, what you want to do is so so uh, one one I think the most critical business related aspect of being a data scientist is operationalizing and converting a statement by a senior leader into something that's measurable, right? So this person says, "Hey, I want to reduce X by Y percent." Uh, or they say, I want to increase revenue on this thing by this amount. You have to say, okay, increase revenue by this amount. What is tied to revenue? How can we measure that tie into revenue? And what aspect of that revenue generation process is the least efficient currently? And how can we use ML to improve that efficiency in some way? Right. So basically, the idea is, is you have to you have to operationalize whatever it is that 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 senior executive um, asked for convert it into something that can be measured, that can be converted into tables and bits, et cetera, and then do that as early as possible, okay? Yeah. And then, and make sure that the senior executive is aware of what those criteria are and agree that they make sense in their context. So for example, if I go back to this original question where the, where the senior executive said, hey, we want to increase uh, uh, our revenue in this specific field by 10%. Okay, so we'll, 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 let's just talk about churn. We want to increase our, our revenue for this specific product by 10%. 
And then you look at the product and you go, okay, well, one way you can do that is by growing your subscriber base. Another way you can do that is by limiting churn. So you go back to the person, you go, okay, you said you want to increase revenue by this much. So why don't we think of a project where we actually increase the subscriber base? So you tell the executive that and they go, no, 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 that's not going to work. We've already saturated the market. There's no more new subscribers that we can tackle and our uh, acquisition costs are going to be too high. So if you, tell, if, you, if you get to that point quickly, you can immediately say, okay, we're not going to start immediately going down the rabbit hole of what can we do to acquire new customers. So let's look at the other thing. Okay, what about churn? What if we reduce churn by this amount? And then the person goes, okay, yes. The executive goes, yes, exactly. So um, the way that I think that we, should, that we should increase our revenue is by limiting churn. And so now immediately you're like, okay, great. I understand that it's a, it's a, it's a churn issue. So let me get to, to, to tackling that. So, I mean, in general, I mean, I think this is, this is, this is what's, what's really important is that you, you by ex- making explicit things that are implicit in what the executive is saying, drawing them out, I think is really important for, for at least starting on the right foot, because otherwise you might, you know, you might assume that they're saying one thing, but they're saying something totally different and you really have to bring it out of them. Um, it, so, so anyway, so that's the first piece. So this, this idea of operationalizing exactly what your success criteria are as early as possible. I mean, basically, as soon as you have that first meeting, you, you, you make sure you understand exactly what it is that they want, they, that, that they are interested in tackling. And anything that is vague is made as explicit as quickly as possible, because that means you can immediately, immediately get started. Now, once you've operationalized that criterion, uh, what were your criterion for success is the next thing, and this is kind of obvious, but you would be shocked at how sometimes how difficult this is, is getting access to the data that you need as early as possible in a project's lifetime. Basically, as soon as you have that first meeting, you need to get access to this data. Whether and it doesn't, it doesn't actually mean you need the full database. You need some, you just need something. You need a um, a sample. You need uh, just anything where the actual real date, what the actual actual real data looks like. It doesn't have to be a, like I said, like access to a production data warehouse. It doesn't have to be all of the flat files that have ever existed, just something. Because ultimately, that's the only way you can really measure the true amount of effort that is going to be necessary for this project to actually become uh, viable. Okay. And The reason I say this is because the only way, and this is the only way that I've ever seen anything work in an organization, it's not because of, I don't think it's not because of anything nefarious, but it's just because people assume they know things that they don't. It's that you don't know the state of that data. Never, ever, ever trust anyone's claims about cleanliness, data structure, data frequency, um, just any assumptions that they have or what they say they think they know about the data until you've done basic EDA on it. So exploratory data analysis on it. You don't know anything about the data. It's basically, it could be anything. They could tell you that it's in a pristine state and then you get it. And like 90% of the columns have, you know, 50% missing values. You know, uh, one column might actually have a combined like several different data formats so like i've seen plenty of times cases where you have a time with something that's a date is is actually both a timestamp, a month and a day and then sometimes it's just like things as unix time i mean there's just so many things that 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 you have to check and see and the only way you can do that is by getting access to a snippet of what you're going to be working on uh, as early as possible OK, um, because the earliest you do that, the better you can understand what your true timelines are going to be. Um, and then the next the next part, I think this is just the inverse of what I had said earlier. So I'd said enemy. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, the perfect becoming the enemy of the good enough. What I'm what I'm saying here is, is look, as soon as you have something that's at some reasonable criterion, stop focusing on the ML and start focusing on, on Stop focusing on the core ML parts of your prod- product and immediately allocate as much uh, re- as many resources as you can to actually standing this thing up. 
because although it's fun to get incremental, there's like a little dopamine rush, right? There's a little dopamine drip that happens anytime you get a slight performance boost in your model. It's not the stuff that's actually going to get your project across the finish line, right? What you need to do is you need to you need to be building out those uh, the non core ML parts of your project in order for it to succeed within the timelines that you've. Uh, told people that they're gonna that they're going to have right. Um, so anyway, so uh, the monitoring, the visualization, the pipelining stuff is, is the stuff that you need to build to get to the finish line. So start building it as soon as you possibly can, um, because that's ultimately what's going to provide true value to both your business and to your to your senior stakeholders. And then lastly, this is just like a general uh, sourcing and uh, allocation and estimation uh, thing uh, that I've, I've learned to do after being burned a couple of times. Basically, you have your internal estimate of how long you think a given project will take. Just double that and then uh, give that as your actual timeline to your senior stakeholder. So if you, if you think that something will take you a month and a half to do, uh, internally, tell the senior executive that it's going to be three months. And that way, when you do deliver it in two and a half months or in two months, uh, it's seen as a, you know, as a huge uh, improvement and like everyone's really, really happy. This again, this is the idea of you always want to uh, 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 under promise and over deliver. Doing that is the way that you get uh uh, senior executives to buy in um, uh, effectively and consistently on the on the projects that you that you begin. Yeah, I think this is really solid advice, and especially when applied to organizations who are still maturing their data science competencies. I would assume, for example, access to data is not a major problem at the Ubers and Airbnbs of the world, but this is quite a ubiquitous problem throughout the industry. And uh, yeah, I think this is super useful. Now, with that in mind, I would like to segue to data democratization, because I think uh, really an important aspect of data science is not only producing data products, uh, but really equipping the rest of the organization with the ability to work with data themselves. Um, how do you view the importance of democratizing data uh, for data science teams as as a strategic imperative? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the the question almost answers itself, right? Like we we know that 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 um, you know uh, data is really important. Data is what's going to uh, uh, unlock the largest amount of business value when applied correctly. So if you can get more people than your organization that aren't pure data scientists or, or, or data engineers or data analysts to have access to that data, to start thinking about it, the more successful that you're going to become. So, I mean, I think it's absolutely critical to provide people outside of data science organizations the tools to be able to, uh, uh, what I like to call, fishing for themselves, right? So uh, if you can, if you do not have an expert background in a, in a you know, a scripting programming language, uh, in statistics, or in, you know, in, in uh, um, I don't know, in SQL or something, it would be really, really great if you could still get to, uh, you know, even half of the kinds of questions that you want to be able to answer, but you currently can't because you just don't have the necessary skills, right? And ultimately, like, having data scientists do these things um, is, is a bad use of resources, right? Like, like getting people, getting people in marketing or in, or in, um, I don't know, in, in product or in some other, uh, part of your organization answers to questions that they have for them, that they should be able to get themselves if the data was in a reasonably structured enough or, or, you know, is, was, was, was placed somewhere where it could be easily accessed by non-technical people, it would just impact them so, so much more, right? Like I said, data scientists are expen expensive and they spend uh, the vast majority of their time organizing and cleaning data much and much less of that time actually mining it, right? So if you think about it, if you can get even a small fraction of your organization, uh, but more than currently are like this, to be able to Either, you know, if I think my dream would be if everyone if everyone could use SQL in the same way that you, they use Excel, right? If they could get, if they could even get to that, that point, I mean, the entire organization would benefit just so immensely, right? Uh, their abilities, the, the organization's abilities to tackle questions quickly, I would bet would grow by like an order of magnitude. Um, so, yeah, so I think data democratization is, is super, super important. 
Yeah, 100%. And even, for example, internally at DataCamp, uh, we have a centralized data warehouse that uh, on top of it, you can have like Metabase or some sort of connection SQL database. And most most people at DataCamp know how to use SQL. And that has really enabled everyone to answer their data questions. If you want to, if you're on the sales team, you want to see who's the account that has the highest sales, you can check that out immediately. If you're on the marketing team, you want to optimize spend somehow. All of this analysis is really done immediately through Metabase. And uh, it has really changed uh like any organization, there are so many things that we can do to become more data mature, but uh, it has really changed how we interact with data in that sense. Well, this is highly use case or industry relevant. Uh, what are some of the low hanging fruit that you find data science teams can quickly implement today to further democratize data science and to, as you said, give people the ability to fish for themselves? Yeah, so I, I think the, the, the quickest things that they can do uh, are two things. One is you provide an aggregated data view um, at the level that uh, business analysts, right, would typically see data and surface it up to people so they can plug out away at it in a dashboard-like environment. So something like a Tableau. Uh, I think that would probably be the first thing. So you basically, you figure out um, some reasonable level of data granularity you surface up a table at that data granularity. You provide updates to that table. Basically, you could, it could be a materialized view, right? You just have a materialized view that's constantly being updated with fresh data at a at a at a um, at a set aggregation level, and then you surface it up either in a dashboard or uh, uh, really, I think the, the, the other way is something like what you just talked about, like a meta base. I know there are other, uh, tools that provide effectively something like an Excel light connector on top of the data warehouse. So if you can even do something like that, I think that would be, that would be a very easy, quick win. I mean, I think if you can get something in a place where people in the organization are reasonably comfortable with something similar to that, so providing something like an Excel-like product, but that actually connects to a data warehouse that has, like I said, you know, terabytes of data, I think that that would, that would be one, one very, very quick way to unlock that value. Now, the, the, unfortunately, you will have to do some kind of, kind of socialization around the do's and don'ts for that, right? Like, so I imagine, you know, if you have people that are, that are you know, you have a, a, a data warehouse and people are using SQL, that's well and good, but you have to just let them know, like, if they're looking at, you know, if they're looking at, you know, the top X in Y, so top salesperson or the top account, uh, across the organization or like who's, I don't know, who's generated the most um, amount of sales over the past month or whatever it is, that's great. But for example, if they're trying to get larger segments of the data, knowing that there are certain things you shouldn't do because it could brick your database <laughs> is really important. So, right. So for example, like people doing a select star without a limit, for example, are things that, or, uh, you know, like basic kind of, um, uh, pitfalls that they should avoid when doing um, uh, when when performing these kinds of queries, right? And I assume that those same kind of things would happen even if you had an Excel-like connector. But I think those are the the the, the two things you can do. One, provide a reasonably uh, a, a, a reasonably aggregated view that can then be accessed by people. And then once you have that pre reasonably app. Uh, reasonably aggregated view, have something like an Excel-like connector that people can connect. I'm going to actually now, I've, I've never used Metabase, but now I'm very interested in what this is. Um, so I'm going to have to check that out. Thank you for that, Adele. Uh, uh, but, but, but I know there are other, yeah, I know there are other tools like that that provide basically a layer, a query layer on top of your data warehouses. So I would, I would suggest that as well. Yeah, exactly. And in your experience as well, what do you think are the obstacles standing in the way of enabling really mature, or robust data democratization? Uh, and what do you think are some of the tactics that can be alleviated there? Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, uh, this is going to be my my plug for Data Camp here in this in this podcast. I think the first thing that I think the first thing that's uh, that I would say is like, look, there's there's fundamentally a skills disconnect between what's necessary in the modern in the modern database. Um, company and what people actually possess. So I think the first thing that people should learn is just learn SQL. Take some courses on Data Camp and learn SQL. If you don't want to use Data Camp, go somewhere else and learn SQL, but learn some SQL. Like I think that is uh, absolutely the most, the, the, the best way for a person to level up 
their data abilities uh, uh, nowadays. If you can learn SQL, it's the Excel, it's older than Excel, more powerful than Excel, um, at least from a data munging perspective, maybe not from a, from, from a bunch of other perspectives, but I think that's really important. I think anybody that is comfortable in Excel should learn to become comfortable in, an ex, in a SQL environment. Um, and I mean, you think about a business analyst, I mean, they live and breathe Excel, right? They know it really well. Then I do all sorts of crazy. I mean, I've seen people do stuff in Excel that I was just like, what is this? This doesn't look, this is, this is not Excel. This is like some weird abstract, like you have like scripts in here. I mean, there's like where the cell, where a cell has literally enough text inside of it to fill an entire page. I and mean, it's like, dude, what, you're literally... Yeah, you're you're literally like like creating a Mario clone inside of this Excel spreadsheet. Like what like like what are you doing? So so you clearly have if you can create, you know, if you can create Tetris inside of an Excel window, you can you learn to use SQL, okay? You are very, very good at you are very, very good at, at, at manipulating data. It's a little bit different way to think, but you should totally be able to do that, right? Um, so, and in general, that's kind of that's kind of the way that that that, that you're going to have to mature as a just technically yourself and just your entire data org as a whole, because like data now lives in the cloud, right? Like there's no the the time of people passing around Excel spreadsheets and saving them to some like J drive somewhere. I mean, that's going to keep existing, but that's not where you're going to be. That's not where your golden records are going to live. If you as an organization are still living in a world where everything that all of your master data sits across 300 or 500 different Excel spreadsheets, which is a really, I mean, maybe that's sustainable in the near term, but that's just not going to be sustainable over the longer term. So put that, that stuff's going to be in a cloud data warehouse. It's going to be in a, in a, in a cloud database of some sort in order to be able to access it, in order to be able to perform any kind of a non, um, trivial query on it, any kind of a non-trivial aggregation on it, you're going to need to use SQL. So you might as well learn. Right. So I think that's just absolutely important. I think you can do that in lots of places. I know the data camp has some excellent uh, SQL courses. So uh, those of you out there that want to learn more, you should totally check that stuff out. I didn't uh, write any of them. So this is not a plug for any of my courses. Um, but uh, anyway, so that's, I think, the first uh, the first thing I would say. The, the next is, uh, I think, a uh, it's more of a. Um, uh, a, a description of, of the kind of the entire data enterprise as a whole. And it's really this lack of understanding or an appreciation of how the way in which whatever your source data is, wherever it's coming from, those signals, how they're collected or stored impacts how quickly or easily a given question can be answered. So I think this is more of a, this is, this is more of a, a problem again for senior executives where they just assume like, Hey, we have this data, right? So why can't you just answer this question, right? Like we we have the data, we have every every possible interaction that's ever happened on our website or on our app or on our service, whatever it is. Why can't you just tell me how many X's are in Y? And the reason that I can't tell you that is because of the way that one, the data is stored or to the day, the way that the data was collected. And so having an appreciation that, hey, if for example, uh, the way that we store sessions is separate from the way that we store users means it's very difficult to figure out how many unique users were on your platform over the past month. Um, it means that, that like if senior executives don't appreciate that, if they don't understand that, hey, like the way this data is actually sourced makes it so that what you think is a simple question to answer is actually a kind of a difficult question to answer. It's not nearly as trivial as you thought. So basically this, 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 you know, getting, getting people, and I've definitely had to do some of this myself and it's paid dividends because they then can push back on others and be like, why the hell was this built like this? Why did we not, you know, do it this way? And that immediately, I think it, it, it basically makes, it just makes the um, accountability for how data is processed, cleaned, how it's stored, a lot more visible, a lot more transparent. And when you identify why there are these kinds of breaks in the system, 
uh, uh, or, or gaps in the system, it immediately makes it so that everyone has to talk to each other a lot more. And the more that they talk, the more ultimately, hopefully, the issues that they're having are going to be solved. So, I mean, I think, I think that's that's really the the other the second op- obstacle to this data democratization. It's it's really this this notion of like. Hey, being able to understand how the data was sourced and being able to to effectively evangelize how the data is structured immediately lets people lets people understand and know two things. One is the they they have more of an appreciation for how difficult some things are, but they also now uh, also have a, a much better understanding of like, hey, if something takes a while, it means there's probably some significant gaps in the way that things are happening. So, I mean, I know this isn't really a, a, a point on democratization, but I think it's more of like a, a, a point on, on democratization of, of the challenges around data <laughs> as opposed to data access, if you will. No, I, I, th- I think democratizing data access and giving providing extreme context around how data is sourced and how it impacts a given function is also super important in the, the formula of data democratization. Sergey, it was a huge pleasure chatting. And before we let you go, do you have any other call to action? to make uh you know i um one i uh, wanted to say thank you very much adele this was really really lovely uh this was a, a great way to kind of for me to relive my entire data journey up to this point so uh this was this was this was cool um uh i think really the only call to action i really have is uh I think everyone should, you know, uh, practice a little bit more humility when it comes to data science. I think, I mean, this stuff is hard, and I think that everyone, most people, have their their kind of their best, uh, um, or the, your companies or whoever it is that you're doing, you have the, the best interests in mind. I don't think everyone is out there nefariously trying to ruin data projects. Uh, so I think practicing some humility when it comes to both you know, uh, practicing data science and also evangelizing for data science is really, really important. And I think as part of that, like when you're, when you're humble, it means that you always have room for growth. You have, you have more opportunities to learn. I think, you know, ultimately, um, learning is the way that, that you make both the largest impact within, within any organization that you work for, but it also makes for a much more meaningful life. I mean, I've, I've enjoyed learning uh, about new techniques, new, new uh, frameworks and all of that stuff. And I think as long as you keep learning uh, as a data scientist or really just across your entire life, uh, I think you'll find that your work and the things that you do are going to become a lot more meaningful. So that's, that's my hope for everyone. Stay humble and stay, stay learning. That's awesome. And I would highly recommend that you check out Extreme Gradient Boosting on Data Camp taught by Sergey Fogelson. And with that in mind, thank you so much, Sergey. Thank you. Thank you again, Adele. That's it for today's episode of Data Framed. Thanks for being with us. I really enjoyed Sergey's insights on how data science has evolved over the years and what is still remaining to really scale the impact of data science across organizations and industries at large. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to leave a review on iTunes. Our next episode will be with Bar Moses, CEO of Monte Carlo Data, on the data quality challenges data teams face and the importance of data observability and reliability. I hope it will be useful for you, and we hope to catch you next time on Data Framed.